Thanks. Okay. Hi, everybody. Uh, Mr. Mark, you want to uh, Yeah. Yeah. Uh, here we are. It's noon, September 16th, and uh, this is Tinderbox Meetup. I'm Tinderbox designer Mark Bernstein, and I'm here in sunny Massachusetts, where the hurricane, we hope, like the ladies of the harem of the court of King Caracatus, is just passing by. But it's blowing up a storm out there. Uh, next week, by the way, Sunday meeting, and we hope to have ex eSkater and game studio executive Stacy Mason here to talk about Tinderbox in the writing room. Uh, but this week, we're honored to have Professor Joel Chan from the University of Maryland, who's doing some dynamite research on systems that support creative knowledge work. And here's our host, Michael Becker. Hi, everybody. Um, welcome to our Tinderbox meetup. Uh, just for those that might that meet this, this might be your first time. Uh, we are uh, this whole community is built around uh, knowledge management and how do we use various knowledge management tools and services to understand and build uh, uh, and manage our own personal knowledge. Uh, obviously, re revolving around the tool that is Tinderbox, but a whole bunch of other tools that fall within the community like Obsidian and Rome and uh, BB Edit and Devon Think and a whole, you know, Pandoc, whatever you may see, the, you know, this collection of tools that we use to manage and build our knowledge. Um, typically, we, the way we run these forums is we go around the room and new people invite themselves uh, or introduce themselves if they so choose. Uh, we then would dig into particular topics that any one of us are um, working on through our use of Tinderbox or some other theme that we might be considering. Uh, and then we jump into a theme. And luckily today we have a theme and the theme is Joel Chan uh, and his uh, use in, of developing knowledge management, um, you know, the using discourse graphs. And I was fortunate enough and the reason why Joel's here with us today is Tom Diaz, one of our community members, told me about Joel about a year ago. And he's like, you got to get Joel on. Um, and um, Joel really does a lot. He's got his own personal set of tools that he uses. Uh, but then he also does a lot of collaborative community work and such. And that's, I believe, what Joel wants to talk to us about today is that whole system that he brings to the table on how to both do his own work and work with others to further this body of knowledge. And uh, with that in mind, and so we can uh, leverage all of our time that we have with him today, let's just skip all of the preamble and jump right into Joel. So, Joel, you have the floor. Awesome. Michael, I'm so excited. It's been a long time coming. I think the we initially scheduled this for July or something. Yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's really cool to see everybody here. Um, I actually don't know Tom, uh, so I'd love to meet Tom. Uh, I also it's kind of Tinderbox connection uh, that I'll point you to um, that was using some of my, my methods in Tinderbox. And so I was like super curious to kind of talk with people interactively about uh, kind of the overlaps. Um, in some ways, uh, the things I'm working on in the systems building uh, are recapitulating what Tinderbox has perfected, uh, but sort of like in different tools sort of spreading it. So I'm really curious to hear from you about the overlaps. Uh, I'm gonna drop a link in the chat to this uh, kind of collaborative, uh, this document that has all my notes in it. Um, it has been set to public, so anybody can read it if you want to. Uh, I'm not sure how the CSS works, so you may not see exactly the same thing that I do, uh, but everything, the links in here sort of makes it easier for you to, to kind of follow it. Uh, if you've successfully opened it, can you give me a thumbs up? Yep. Excellent. All right, cool. All right, so uh, I'm going to talk, give you a little bit more background about myself so that uh, for me personally, I think uh, my biggest thing with PKM is that it's P. Uh, so it's super useful to know what the goals of the person is and what their context is in order to understand why they're doing what they do. So I'll share a little bit about um, who I am, what I do, and what my goal is for uh, my PKM. And then um, I really want to talk to you today about um, how I've developed a system to help me with synthesis, I'll explain a little bit what that looks like, uh, how it works. And then I want to sort of discuss open problems and questions and how this intersects with Tinderbox, which may end up happening while I'm talking through my process, but I'll sort of catch all hopefully at the end to catch anything that we haven't talked about. That's the game plan. Awesome. Uh, I I have not timed this, so we'll see we'll see how it goes. Uh, so let's get a little bit into uh, about me. So my website is has a link here. Um, as you mentioned, I'm an academic. Um, 
by profession, I do research and teach um, at the College of Information Studies at the University of Maryland. Uh, so let's zoom in a little bit here. So this is a super interdisciplinary community. Uh, whenever I explain to people that I'm in a College of Information Studies, they're like, what does that mean? Uh, I don't know. I sometimes tell people that just means I can do whatever I want because uh, I can draw from whatever discipline or perspective and work on whatever problem I like, as long as it has to do with information, which, as you might guess, is super broad. Uh, we've got data mining people. We've got sociologists. We have archivists and librarians. We have historians. We have uh, people who invent new kinds of books. We have uh, HCI um, designers, builders, um, visualization people. That's my current anchor community. Um, and then psychologists as well. Um, both social and cognitive. <clears throat> My particular background is uh, I went from psychology as an undergrad to cognitive science PhD, uh, which turned out to be a stealth HCI PhD. Um, I didn't know it. I was studying computational systems for analogical problem solving. A link to my dissertation is there in case you're curious. <clears throat> and then I spent four years um, in an HCI lab doing a postdoc essentially like a second PhD, uh, developing HCI methods, uh, learning how to do systems prototyping, um, integrating applied machine learning, all that kind of stuff. Uh, and now I'm here and my overarching goal is I'm studying systems that support creative knowledge work, specifically like examples like design, scientific discovery. So I'm actually my own research subject. Uh, the, hopefully my research as it advances, it helps me do my work as well. And uh, I conceptualize systems super broadly. It's like individual cognitive skills, interfaces, tools, practices, kind of the PKM, uh, but also collaborative organizational dynamics and tools. And then digging even deeper underneath the surface, the soup that we swim in, the infrastructures of search engines, standards, libraries, the whole information environment that in which we do our work. Um, there's a link to a recent talk that gives an overview of how this plays out through a central current third of my research. Um, and yeah, so that's that's my background. So uh, the main thing I want to convey is that I do research. Um, it's super interdisciplinary. Um, draws from lots of different um, research methods, research areas. So I have a very strong need to synthesize. I kind of just sort of like build off of like a growing list of problems. So like everybody knows that, you know, the next thing is to do X. Like I'm sort of trying to integrate across Lots of different levels of analysis, lots of different disciplines. Okay, so um, that gives you a sense of my PKM goals. Uh, so I I do have a personal setup that helps me with task management, um, planning, journaling, reflection. That's not really here. Um, I'm going to share with you like sort of my PKM setup for research. Uh, so personally, my goal is to support interdisciplinary deeper collaborative synthesis. Uh, I wrote up essentially what I want um, in, in this publication here, which is um, over here to describe this. Um, but actually one of your uh, Tinderbox community members, Beck Tench, really encapsulates my motivation for developing a system. Um, she made this analogy to design where designers have a process that they can trust and I want to have something like that for research. I want to have a process with a set of practices and tools that I can turn to. Um, if research is taking a long time, I know I can trust the process. I didn't have that actually during my dissertation or my postdoc. It was sort of like trying my best to do things and sort of like in spite of my tooling and my process, I got things done and um, it didn't feel good. I want to be able to trust the process to have like a feeling of like, I can get into this flow. I know what's happening. <clears throat> so that's my goal personally. And more and more as a person who works a lot with other people, I want this to sort of spill over into how it feels when they collaborate with other people. <clears throat> so that's my personal goal. And then my research goal is to invent better systems and infrastructures for collective synthesis. Um, so how many of you actually here are researchers, like you do research as part of your job, um, whether it's a PhD or, um, I know I know some of you are, right? Uh, I recognize some faces, excellent. Um, so you, you'll recognize probably some of this like pain of um, having to fight 
the scholarly communication infrastructure to find answers to questions, right? Like it's really hard to, it's really easy to find papers and authors, but it's really hard to ask questions like, what is the evidence that supports this hypothesis that's really popular? Like, let me trace that. Or um, what are different theories that can frame and explain this particular result? That's all kind of in people's heads. You can't actually query this directly um, in most mainstream scholarly communication infrastructures like Google Scholar. Um, you can kind of do this now with some language models with Elicit, but it's still kind of operating on top of a infrastructure that doesn't really support this. You got keywords, you got titles, you got abstracts, uh, papers, but you don't really have this like, I want to ask questions about questions, about claims, about evidence, about theories. <clears throat> So there's a little bit of a quote here that you can look at if you're curious to give you a concrete example of this uh, that's written up in one of the people in the field that's also working on this at the infrastructure level. So the thing that I think is interesting, useful to keep in mind as I go through my system is that this is both a personal project and a research project where my hypothesis is that we can invent ways of working that synergize the two goals of in improving individual synthesis on a day-to-day -day basis and finding ways to sort of let the bleed over into helping other people do synthesis and helping communities and entire fields structure their information to support synthesis better. <clears throat> What's good for me is also good for me is what I want. <clears throat> so um, Tobias Kuhn, it's one of the kind of main people in the space. And um, they have this idea of nano publications as one kind of infrastructure that um, helps people discover and ask questions that they actually want to ask. Um, and they have this vision of, you know, we've got bots kind of doing data mining to produce this infrastructure and specialized curators, users, authors kind of doing nano publications. And I'm interested in like, look, we kind of do this already on an individual level. Can we build tools that um, structure that process for us individually and then contribute that and share that out with other people? So, so, so Joel, can I interrupt real quick? How yeah, is, please do. It seems like you're getting to a defined problem that needs to be solved. And could you say that in like one sentence or a couple of keywords? Like one is the problem that we need to keyword. solve public infrastructure for sourcing evidence? Like that's a yeah, that, that's a that's a decent way to to summarize the the question. Um, how would I summarize in one sentence? Um, how do we build a um, scholarly community infrastructure that helps researchers um, easily um, trace? Um, that's a good question. Yeah. I've got different ways of saying this. <laughs> so uh, I think the way you said it is, is a good is a good way to summarize. Um, like the sort of super pithy um, one sentence line is like, how do we actually get re build an infrastructure that helps researchers ask the questions they want to ask? Um, and it turns out the specific things about claims and evidence um, is just really hard right now. <clears throat> awesome. That's the high level yeah. uh, on the kind of research side. All right, so yeah, so what I'm sharing is driven and informed by this um, hypothesis. Uh, I'm seeing some stuff pop in the chat, so I'm gonna pop in there just just a second to see. Uh, so Max is asking that. if you're a historian. I'm not a historian. <laughs> uh, oh no, I think Max is asking David if David's a historian. Uh, although uh, I have to say, one of my during my doc, um, doctoral study efforts, one of my teachers said, you know, a PhD or a DBA in the end of the day becomes a historian of your ideas, whatever the theme you're researching. I like that framing. And your goal is to add a unique piece of knowledge on the stack of the history of the topic you're studying. Yeah. So in that regard, any researcher to a certain extent is a historian. In the in the knowledge and themes that they're working on, I think it's a useful analogy. Yeah, not everybody's doing it that way though. Uh, some people just like take the latest papers and then they build on top of that, and they don't really understand the kind of history of the the discourse and open problems and so on. Um, well, and actually, for coming from the Tinderbox forum, this um, 
uh, just this week, we had one of our members, um, let me find the maxim that he said it really quick, but it was quite interesting because we were having this back and forth discourse. And he said the maximum that, uh, that he came up with was, and I got to find the right file, was basically you've got to start from the roots and look up to really master something. Ah, I like that. Start from the roots. Yeah. Yeah. Because you got to know also what you want to build on, what you don't want to build on. Uh, sometimes lost ideas turn out to be super relevant now. Um, and you can learn a lot from history of like failed attempts to solve problems as well. Yeah. yeah so the maximum uh, specifically was observe, uh, observer depius less racinus, observed from the roots. And that's how wow. Wait, what language is that? I think it's Latin. French? Oh, it came oh, out Latin. of the country. And, then the, and the other one is uh, that one is French, step by step. It came out of the forum this week. I'll drop, drop in the URL. Very cool. <clears throat> All right. Uh, okay. So last bit of background. Uh, how did I come here? So I was a pretty typical, uh, had a pretty, cool, pretty typical setup during my PhD and in my postdoc um, spreadsheets for lit reviews. So I got like, you know, a bunch of papers and then I break it out into almost like analyzing, you know, what's the problem? What's the sample type? What's the main design? This is a spreadsheet I use for my dissertation. And then a bunch of Word docs um, where I just like write things out. And um, honestly, a very common pattern I see now is that uh, people don't really take notes. They just draw from their previous drafts of grants and literature review sections and introduction sections from previous papers. So it's like sort of distributed across uh, all these like drafts of things that they've written. Um, so often like when you're writing a new paper, you pull up an old paper and like source the references from there. Um, and, That's and, and, be, and to be clear, this is a community of tool geeks, not to be disparaging of anyone, but as I'm like top of the top of the pile, uh, the tool you're using here is Rome, correct? Correct. Ah, oh, thank you. Sorry. Yeah. So yeah, this is, I mean, so I'll get to that, right? So this is, this is, uh, yeah, this is, this is Rome, uh, which is, um, I think came around end of 2019 is when, when it came out. So much younger, much, much younger than Tinderbox. Um, and so my, uh, I'm not going to talk about Evernote. You can kind of click through here if you want to see it. I went through a brief Evernote phase. Um, it was mostly, um, mostly task management. This is why I tried to do yeah, getting things done in Evernote. So roughly around 2019, uh, 2019 uh, I came across uh, Zettelkasten uh, and that led me to Rome. So one of the inspirations was actually um, Backtench, um, and she was showing how she did lit review using Zello Custom in Tinderbox. And I was really inspired. And again, this is that quote, right, that I mentioned of this, like, I want to have a trust, a process that I can trust. And she felt like Zello Custom and Tinderbox was a way to do this. And I was like, ha, huh, this looks really interesting. There might be something here. And I sort of went down this kind of rabbit hole in PKM. I think Zello Custom sort of as like one entry point into um, a nice like space of thinkers and uh, process people. Uh, so Stan Hakleff uh, was the first place I saw Rome because this person was like a researcher, serious researcher, um, had done a lot of like research on wikis and hypertext back in the day and was like saying, hey, there's something interesting here with Rome. So that caught my eye. Um, now Stan is still kicking, is doing uh, kind of development work at Tana, another sort of new kid on the block. <clears throat> and then uh, Andy Matushak was another kind of like big uh, person in the space. And um, they he has this public notes. Uh, I think it's notes dot Andy Matushak. Is it Andy Matushak notes? Yeah. It's here. Um, and you have this kind of idea of evergreen notes, which is very similar to Zettelkasten. When I saw this, I, at the same time, was kind of, you know, researching different infrastructure uh, models for scholarly communication, this idea of like a declarative claim um, discourse um, was like something that was coming out from the research site. And here I was seeing it on the practice side of like, this helps my thinking when I break my notes down into, among other things, declarative notes with this kind of titles 
that make claims. <clears throat> so Maggie Appleton has a nice like kind of sketch notes thing um, that explains the ideas behind. It's kind of Andy's translation of Zellocastin. I don't know if anybody, uh, it's probably useful for me to kind of drop a, I expect many people in this community to have heard of Zellocastin, but maybe not. Very um, much so. Yeah, right. <clears throat> so it's very, I think, very, very nice fit with uh, kind of the hypertext uh, way of thinking um, links between atomic uh, concepts. <clears throat> so the idea of like links between atomic things, atomic notes is kind of the precursor. And then this one adds the idea of like some of those atoms are claims. Like that's interesting. So I made an attempt to um, kind of implement this in Rome um, because it was free at the time was the main thing. I was like, I want to quickly prototype this. Um, I saw somebody try this. Uh, let me see how it works. Um, so I did that. Um, I'm not going to play this video, but there's a link here to, <clears throat> um, I think early 2020 was my process. Um, kind of, you can see how, how it looked like. And then, um, then I started thinking more deeply about trying to connect the two between the kind of evergreen notes that are constant practice mm -hmm. and the stuff from the theory side of uh, how do we actually structure what's a good ontology for supporting synthesis in particular. <clears throat> and uh, came up with uh, kind of this model here of um, focusing on assertions, but breaking them out into um, declarative claims, synthesis claims, about the environment, about the world, and empirical observations about um, coming from sort of research. And that can sort of inform the questions that we want to ask. The kind of model comes from- hey, hey, Joel, um, Joel, real quick. Uh, so Tom had actually asked about that. So this idea of a discourse graph yep. or something of that nature. Can, and he wanted you to explore that a little <laughs> bit at some point if you can. Yes. Um, you don't have to do it now, but I just wanted to- I'm going to show you <laughs> the ontology. Uh, I may piss people off by being a little bit loose with the term ontology. Uh, I know enough ontology people to know that I'm not a real ontology person. Um, I'm using ontology in a loose sense of like kind of an information model. Uh, well, no, I'm, just poking, I'm just poking fun at David though, too, because yeah. that's like his buzzword of the day. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. We always talk about ontologies and from the... so go ahead. Yeah. Oh, and I also saw Mark's comment about. Uh, yeah, hypertize Ben Schneiderman, hypertext. Uh, actually, got to play with the hypertize prototype um, in a um, at Kai at the Kai conference earlier this year. They had a bunch of like old computers and they they shared running hypertize system. It was wonderful. Uh, so yeah, it's really really neat. I actually didn't know about the hypertext um, history at UMD when I joined until I started getting into this research. And I was like, ah, oh, so cool. Uh, so quick, Ben's great. Mr. Um, Mr. Anderson, can you pull up the URL? from when Mark Bernstein gave the history of hypertext from like a year ago or so, Ooh. do you remember that? Or Mark maybe, Mark, maybe we can find that talk on the forum. I think Joel would love it. Is this the one that was to Dini's course? Yeah, no, this... and he went through and gave all the history and the dates and when everything started. I think Joel would love yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. First, I, yeah, I cool. think then the real the talk was for tools for thought. That was it, that was it. Oh, yeah. oh nice. Could you? Could you forward that to everybody on the yeah, call? Yeah, we'll drop it in the That'd chat. Great. Yeah. So, okay. Well, I guess this is a good time to, like, I've got some slides for this that can be useful, right? So, like, discourse graph is just a term that I found useful for describing not my idea, but a bunch of other people's ideas for structuring a graph based on nodes that are discourse units, like questions, claims, and evidence. So here's a kind of worked out example. Um, I don't think I can zoom in much more than this without messing up. The, um, yeah, so like, you know, question would be like, are bans an effective way to mitigate antisocial behavior? Then you have various claims, like, yes, it's an effective response. No, it cannot scale. Uh, bad actors who are banned do not resume bad behaviors after ban is lifted and so on. <clears throat> and then this can be supported or opposed by um, other assertions that are essentially like results from empirical studies. Like um, in this Twitch chat study, this is what happened when a user was banned by a moderator. 
right? And it's like very contextualized. And then here it could be in the subreddit context, um, people who are banned for hate speech, they didn't engage in hate speech when they joined new forums. So these are all like contextualized. So you can sort of think of this as like moving up levels of abstraction. Um, so yeah, it's graph structures where nodes are discourse moves and edges are discourse relations. Um, it has to be distinguished from, um, uh, I don't have a picture here, but you've probably seen like knowledge graphs where the units are like say a protein and proteins and disease processes and whatever. And then the edges are sort of much more specific um, meanings like upregulate, downregulate, um, moderate, um, cause, that sort of thing. This is sort of like, that. that's what a discourse graph is. And here are like the kind of precursors um, precursor models that I was drawing on. Um, there's sort of similarities across these. These are like hypotheses about what kind of scholarly communication infrastructure model would support synth synthesis. And it turns out this looks, is really useful for PKM as well. <clears throat> I'm sorry, could you say that last statement again? What did that mean? This loop, this loops? <laughs> this... The, the switch loops? Yeah, I, I don't know. I didn't hear the statement. I, for me, it garbled out a little bit. Like, what did you mean? What was good, useful for PKM? Ah, I see, I see. Uh, these models. So okay. these models were developed to say as hypotheses for how should we structure information in these large databases of research to support people um, doing synthesis and, and knowledge reuse. And it turns out that these information models can also be useful for structuring how we do PKM. Mm, got it. on an individual level is kind of the idea. <clears throat> and my hope is it also goes in the reverse. If more people do PKM in a way that conforms to these models, we could have this kind of common grammar uh, to share knowledge with each other. Not solving everything, but solving um, a particular need of, I want to trace claims and evidence. Well, and by the way, on that note, I, you know, and, and again, David Eddie will smile on this, but I, I was doing a meeting with a client yesterday and we were talking about evaluating you know rcs messaging campaigns and as i was digging into it they themselves use the term for like engagement rate they had five different words they use for the term engagement rate and yeah they them slightly different in each of the different ways yeah and i'm like how do you sell that you don't you know it just creates such a mess and i think that's kind of what you're talking about in a very it's similar way. yeah 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 I actually don't solve that that particular problem of like having different terms. Yeah. Uh, that is, I think, is still an open research problem. But I think uh, the idea is like, you know, particular concepts and terms draw their meaning from their use in context. And uh, these assertions are one kind of nice context to understand um, what a term is in terms of what it relates to. Got it. Right, because like a assertion is just, you can think of it as just a bunch of nodes and edges, right? It's, it's a subgraph. It's describing this causes why, or like this has an effect on whatever, or this does not. And so like different uh, terms and, and so on. Yeah, so. Very cool. But yeah, the, this kind of common common, common language. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, uh, Rome is still popular about academicians. I would say lots of people are moving to Pana, uh, some moving to Tinderbox, some moving to... Um, Lockseek, because uh, it's free. Um, Lock, so Lockseek, I don't know that. Lockseek, what I've heard. What? How do you yeah, spell? Yeah, Lockseek. Uh, it's a, it's a, it's a cross between. Oh, Lockseek. Okay, yeah. Lockseek, yeah, Lockseek. It's, it's still, it's still around. Uh, yeah. In my experience, like Rome, there's the the vibe has really died down. It's not really sort of a, like kind of lively community anymore. Um, and but lots of people are still using it, um, on a quiet like sort of local basis. Um, okay, so that brings us to today. So that's what I'll talk about today, uh, kind of um, using this information model to structure how I take notes, um, how I write, and how I run my meetings and discussions with other people. Um, we So again, we're in Rome, which has a bunch of features out of the box, but one big thing it lacks which Tinderbox has for free, is the ability to define schemas, right? Everything's unstructured in Rome. There's only pages and blocks. Everything's the same. You just link stuff. Links have no meaning. That's not enough for me. And so I had to, I had to explore, like, what would, what would happen if we sort of implemented the ability to define schemas 
um, and uh, define nodes and edges, which again, you get for free in Tinderbox and you get for free in Tana, but a lot of like PM systems uh, don't really have that. Well, I want to pause you right there too, because I think you said something really important and you said, you know, links have no meaning, which is the core and a, a, a response to that would be links should have a meaning. Right. In that, yeah. In that, I, what I mean is very precise, back. actually. I mean something very precise. Okay. The links have no uh, computational meaning. Right. Uh, so Whereas they have the all right. the meaning, the but it's right. all implicit. Right. Like, there's no the actual structure. Can, right. In, in terms of they can, exactly. You can label links. You can exactly. like, have directions to links and then yep. use that for analytical purposes. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that, yeah, I mean something very precise. Um, in Rome, uh, you sort of like emphasize is what it's good at is like the super unstructured early stage thinking, but then you can't really sort of scale up from that to sort of more complex thought um, without applying some structure, and you need schemas to help you with that. Mm. Um, so I'll show you. I'll show you, you made like, an uh, assertion there. I think is important though. To get to complex slot, you need structure. Would, that's that what I think. Good? Yeah, Would that's that, what I yeah. think. Okay. Yeah. If, incidentally, is is that is that a claim? Is that a claim? Uh, I don't think so. That's kind of a hypothesis that I have. That's not. It. I do have a claim about uh, visual spatial thinking being especially useful for early stage knowledge structures. Um, that has uh, kind of a lot of like history behind it. Um, but yeah, this claim that I'm making about structure, I don't have it represented as a claim. Ironically. Got it. Um, I know. All right, sorry to interrupt, but it's it's uh, no. I like this. This is good. Little things are helpful. Yeah, this is this is good. Okay. Um. So yeah, that's 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 the background. We still, I think we're good on time. Um, oh yeah, we got a lot of time. We got an hour. Yeah, we got time. So yeah, I told you my goals. Um. So let's get into it. Let's show you what it looks like now. Um. So I gathered a bunch of examples from my graph. Um. Of what implementing this kind of discourse graph uh, model does for me right now with my research. Okay. So just to give you a bunch of examples, um, at a high level, we have um, the ways that it's helping me with my thinking and writing on an individual level, um, how it works when I work with other people. And how it goes beyond um, literature review to structuring ongoing analysis of primary data, um, which I'll credit to one of my friends who is a kind of now co-developer of the discourse graph idea and extending it to kind of empirical science and being more brave than I am and saying we can change the way research happens in general, not just how we do lit reviews. So I'll get into that a little bit. All right, so examples of solo synthesis. So my dissertation was on analogies and uh, cross-domain analogies and how they sort of help or harm uh, creativity. Um, I translated my lit review from my dissertation into um, a question and into different claims or hypotheses that are answers to that question. And then did the work of trying to audit my understanding of to what extent the different claims are grounded in particular bits of evidence. So we have like positive results on like analytical distance is helpful for creativity. Um, we have um, a bunch of these specific results. Linear regression. Okay, thanks so much. This this is a lot of fun, and it's great. Sorry, someone can you turn off your mute. Someone's oh, playing Mark's video, I think. This is like the good old days, and there are lots of people here. Got it. Oh, I thought somebody was leaving. No, no, it was it was Mark's <laughs> for thought. Somebody uh, somebody yeah. clicked on the link. Yeah, no worries. Okay. By the way, you got to uh, watch that later. It's awesome. I will. Yeah, good. I will. Um, yes. Mm -hmm. Oh man, that's such a juicy, juicy comment from David in the chat that I want to get to later. Um, really resonate with that. Um, you want to find that synthesis between no structure and having some kind of explicit structure. Um, yeah, so this is an example of a evidence node, right? 
that really encapsulates a particular result that I, it's fading from my memory very strongly. Um, this is like a classic, highly cited paper on uh, analogies. And there's a very specific con context for this, right? This was senior engineering students, product design, and the specific measure was um, judged originality and willingness to pay. And they found this kind of like small, um, but positive, right? Effect, a positive effect of analogical distance. Uh, this is not maybe not useful for you because you're not in the field, but this is really useful for me <laughs> because I can go back and see like, okay, all right. These were, oh, this was good. Yeah, 119 students. Um, this is what they actually used, right? They, uh, the task was this kind of cup holder thing and they gave these analogies. Um, I wrote up my limitations notes about it. All that's packed into this thing, right? So if I were to come back to this, I can see, well, what's the, this is why I wrote there's a weak support. And I was like, nah, it's kind of iffy, iffy results. Um, and then we got like citation level data. We have this like result from Uzi, where we have this like sort of, um, they looked at combination distance between the papers they cite, and then they estimate the extent to which it's going to be a hit paper, which I don't remember what the definition was. Uh, it was... Hey, by the way, how are you getting that right side on your screen? Oh, that's just, that's by default. Uh, so that's the way that Rome works. Um, I know, but I've opened up your page and I'm not getting that. Is there a button that needs to be pressed? You have to right here. Do you see this on the top right? Yeah. So there's nothing in there, but if you shift and click on one of these, it should open the sidebar, in the sidebar. Got it. Does that work? No, not working for me. I, d I never know like what, what you're able to do when you're accessing Rome as a guest without an account as yeah. opposed to have edit access. Got it. So I would expect, you... yeah, if you want to see the sign in. You don't have to are, sign are in. Are you sharing your Rome by chance? Are you sharing your, uh, do you have a link? That'd be great to see what you're you know, looking it, at. You put your... it in the chat. Cool. Thank you. Oh, Tim, it's at the top of the chat. I'm happy to reshare it. No, no, it's fine. It's at the top of the chat. You got it. Oh, okay. Well, sometimes like if you, I don't know if you join a little bit later. There you go. Yeah. I did. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. So like I, I can't see Zoom links in the chat Um, if I joined. Um, oh yeah, that's right. Before I joined. That's right. Yeah. So that's an example of what it looks like. What this does for me is it helps me structure and like I can sort of like avoid being frozen in like my assessment of what the state of the literature was at that time, but sort of be able to update it. It's like, these were the specific results that informed my thinking. I can go back to them. If the new evidence comes in, I can sort of like add, and that's what I actually did. Um, we have uh, some outsider innovation stuff. I already had that. I did some extra reading um, with, uh, another colleague and added some new results. I think uh, one of them was this one, yeah. So I hadn't read this paper during my dissertation, obviously, because my dissertation was 2014. Um, but I kind of sort of add this to my ongoing understanding of the question about analogical distance. Yeah. So this was a new new paper I read. I capsulated this result. Um, Patents filed by inventors who were new to the patents field tended to receive slightly fewer citations, except when they collaborate with an expert in the new field. And I can see um, what the results were and what the context was, which was quite good. Um, so that's an example of like kind of consulting old notes for future reuse. Um, I did this with a student. Um, formulating a new research direction and we sort of read a bunch of papers to try to understand what are some of the key open problems in trying to in involve users uh, from diverse backgrounds in participatory design. Um, and we were able to summarize a bunch of uh, key results from prior work into different kinds of like hypotheses about problems, right? There's like a layers of interpretation problem, there's a materials and trappings of design problem. This is supported by these specific results. Um, and this turned out to kind of structure the dissertation project for the student, because um, there was lots of interesting uh, examples of this, but not a lot of good solutions for this problem of 
where do you choose to do uh, co-design turns out to be super important. A um, bunch of other kind of open problems. So it allows us to structure our thinking because um, it was kind of a new area for, for all of us. Um, writing out a design argument for a project also, um, trying to understand what is the goal of the users that we're trying to serve and what are the um, particular constraints and obstacles. And so we can summarize a bunch of, encapsulate a bunch of research um, into these claims. And these are the obstacles, right? Like people um, don't really think uh, easily for analogies across domains. And so we can sort of encapsulate easy access to all this literature in this particular part of the argument. Okay, and how, really do find, how do you find yourself in this process, not getting just lost in the sea of links and notes? I That's mean, a good question. To, yeah. So to your point of this becoming personal, and we saw yeah. this with Jerry's brain uh -huh. um, six weeks or so ago, in that he was just navigating and using the brain and just going all yeah, over yeah. the place. And it really just became very clear, and it seems similar to you, mm -hmm. in a different context of a tool, is the familiarity of yeah. data. Yeah, yeah. Navigation of the particular tool. Yeah. So I'm not sure I understand. One of the things that helps by implementing this process is uh, because I'm doing this kind of soft typing of different notes, right? So this is a claim. This is a question. I can apply CSS to it. And that helps me navigate a little bit more easily. So there's a bunch of text here, but I actually not looked at this in literally a year, probably. Um, but once I come back here, I can quickly scan through and say, these are this part is pretty developed, right? Um, this part is pretty developed. It goes, it references some claims. I can recontextualize very easily. I can go back to this and say, these are the things. So that's how I navigate. Like I look for um, if I'm going back to an old argument and I know what parts have been developed because they are associated with claims, because claims are things I've thought through enough to be able to articulate an assertion. And then the parts that are not uh, marked as a claim or not linked to evidence are things I need to flesh out more. Um, so that helps me navigate on a sort of meta level what parts of my thinking are at what stage of development. And the claims are a nice way to access um, the literature and evidence that I want to go back to to develop my ideas more. And, and it seems too that you have a visual affordance here as well. Like it looks like claims are green, questions are brown. Yeah, yeah. So this is personal, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so naming patterns. Uh, is definitely a desire path. And people do this without uh, this kind of a emerging use pattern that I think I, I absolutely agree, um, you know, gives a desire path. Like people need to have types of notes. Uh, they want to be able to do that. Uh, Rome doesn't allow you to do that. And so we hack it, right? We add these prefixes, um, we add CSS. Um, so how I implement it specifically is is in a way similar to uh, prototypes to my understanding where I have a schema. Uh, so we made this extension and says, um, essentially formalizing what users are doing. So with a claim, we'll say, um, exactly, I hack it. <laughs> um, oh, this is not gonna work because there are too many claims. Let me need to, um, so there's a grammar like a, essentially under, under the hood is a, um, oh shoot, I can't remember the term now, um, graph database data log query um, that recognizes, look for a page title that starts with CLM. And then this is a sort of saved query of note titles that have that pattern. 
So you can recognize that as a type of thing. And then you can use that to recognize uh, sort of higher level patterns of if I'm looking at a claim and there's a piece of evidence that's indented underneath it, then I can say, uh, define particular kinds of relationships because I know something more than just this is a piece of text. This is again is is literally hacking because we literally brought a software extension. What's nice about Rome is that they made it very easy to uh, write extensions uh, to manipulate how how things work in Rome, and this is why um, I sort of like explored this. But yeah, that's and, like and for right. those listening to this, I mean, you have a similar approach in Tinderbox with the use of action code and export code. Mm -hmm. right? And so action code and export code are effectively a plugin, you know, and that enables us to share our templates and our code back and forth with each other to do. Oh, OK, cool. Similar mm. things. And you have yeah. in, in terms of pattern matching, you know, Mark's built in uh, regex engines so you can use regex yeah, yeah, yeah. and the yeah. operators to pattern match, which then will drive agents to re you know, resolve those finds. So yeah. very similar um, capabilities are in Tinderbox. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, so I knew about prototypes. I didn't know about the action uh, export import. Um, yeah, I'm going to have to refresh this. So as I'll get to later, one of the problems with Rome is its performance. Um, and it's really starting to, I'm really starting to feel it. Uh, so I'm in the market for migrating at some point or like trying to figure out. Well, and, and again, on that note, maybe we have a follow-up call next week because Tinderbox can do pretty much everything I've seen you do here. Plus, I agree. Um, plus, we've recently in the last few weeks have been developing optimization methods for like files with thousands of notes, tens of thousands of notes. Nice. Yeah. Really, yeah. 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 Um, yeah. I'll say, I'll say like, you know, again, like I 100% I agree. Like, I think everything that I'm, I'm going to show you, um, I expect you to be able to do easily in Tinderbox. Um, and part of the value of doing this in a tool that doesn't have it was to kind of understand what gets what you gain by adding it. And also Rome is like super easy for people to to use in terms of they don't need to have a particular operating system. All they need is a browser. Um, so that sort of helped with uh, the prototyping. But um, Tinderbox is one of the, yeah, I would say like is, is a good base infrastructure uh, tool for uh, my vision of if all people did things in a particular way, if they use Tinderbox, if they use, um, they have that structure that can be shared. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, force reload. Reload. Nope. It's totally froze. Okay, so we'll start again. Um, but that's just a note, need a name for some other than so you are issue. Yep, exactly. Um so yeah, it really helps with navigation, right? Uh it helps me recognize like fruitful parts of my notes, um, things that are easier to reuse, um, sort of hops along the way to high value things of particular types. Like a claim is a good waypoint to get to other claims, literature. Uh, so I'm searching for literature. Um, often claim is a good sort of starting point. Um, you know what? I may need to use my browser if this doesn't work. So here we go. Cross platform. All right. So that was a solo synthesis. Um, got these examples. Um, so that's kind of like a bit more formal, but just this past week, I was uh, revising the introduction, the argument for introduction for a research paper. Uh, so this is a sense of like how it works, like literally five days ago, I think is when I did it. Um, so I drew from, um, these claims, um, that I showed you right, to kind of revise the introduction flow. What's nice about claims is that they're kind of like topic sentences for paragraphs, right? So that really gives you a nice like way to kind of think through an argument. There are steps in an argument, aren't they? Um, there are assertions, and then you can sort of pull in the evidence to um, substantiate, right? And these will be citations, right? So this is a specific result from classic studies, 
Um, there's another kind of open problem um, here. You know, I actually made this. Yeah, I made this this week, right? To organize a recurring question that we're working on, which is like, how do you build systems to support analogical retrieval? So I put a bunch of stuff in here. We have like, um, you know, previous um, demonstrations of strategies from psychology studies, and then a bunch of other techniques and then other computational approaches. So there's like a, questions are another like good waypoint, right? So a recurring question instead of a topic is focused and I can sort of go back there and um, retrieve a bunch of um, evidence and citations and so on. And, and how do you, in your process, how do you distinguish between like, you know, in, in looking at this is the idea of a claim, the note of a claim, is that being duplicated all over the place or does it have one one location and it's just being referenced? The right. latter. Well, yeah, from a data structure point of view. From a data structure point of view. From a data structure point of view. Having a bunch of duplicated files or are you actually getting uh, the ability to, you know, maintain, manage that claim in one place and then use it in different different The letter. The letter, yeah. Uh, so a similar way to like this a classic hypertext, right? Like you've got like a particular uh, data item and then you reference or transclude it um, in other places rather than duplicating it so yeah. that you can sort of, yeah, edit it in one place. Exactly. Um, there's a different uh, thing that's related to your 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 question, which is, do claims get duplicated regardless of like from a data structure point of view? And the answer is yes. Uh, and this helps reduce that duplication, right? So I'm not like sort of starting from scratch again. I can sort of pull back like referencing what could have done before, uh, which is like, I think just a standard feature of hypertext. Um, it's like a standard benefit of having this kind of system. Yeah, so this was this was actually drafted like this week. Um, this helped me sort of pull back, and uh, I think that the speed of the revision was comparable to what I would do in the past, where I would just have Zotero or my citation manager in my memory to try to pull back the particular citations. But I felt better about this because, <laughs> like, I don't always trust my memory, and depending on how much sleep I get, like, you know, depending on. Uh, you know, how, how rigorous I'm being. Uh, so this like helped me sort of uh, almost like a second check to like, yes, actually there was this result. Yes, actually this is the right citation. Um, you know, it's really helpful for me. And um, I'll con I can come back to this six months from now and pick right up from this because there's a lot of context. Um, it's not just like a citation, but a bunch of like evidence I can see here. Okay, you know, there's like, I just, this level of thinking is not super fleshed out because there's like specific, references but i haven't synthesized it into claims or evidence and so that's my that's my guardrail it was like be be cautious because like you know i my memory is going to fade and like you know i gotta sort of take the time to um i get I have more confidence um if i've sort of like put this into a this is like a variant of a claim it's like a kind of like concept to a purpose mechanism schema and, and what does ptn stand for Pattern. Pattern. Okay. Yeah. Um, conceptually, it's like a like a building block, like a concept. Um, so we can have claims about patterns, or patterns can be a collection of claims. Um, we'll get into that a little bit. Uh, part of the discourse graph idea, again, it's like it's kind of similar to what you do in Tinderbox and prototypes, like giving people the ability to extend and develop their own schemas. Um, and so in Rome, the discourse graph extension, which allows me to say. I want to recognize types of things as claims and evidence. I can define other types that I care about. And it turns out it's really useful for me from a design standpoint to mark particular concrete systems, examples of like specific artifacts and the design patterns that they exemplify. And that helps me sort of navigate prior literature, not from the empirical standpoint, but from a design standpoint. Uh, so this kind of ex extending the schemas. So we're getting away a little bit away from discourse graph specific territory of like questions, claims, and evidence, but it's useful to sort of put them in the same graph because we can have evidence about artifacts. We can have theories that substantiate a particular design pattern. We have design patterns as answers to questions, right, and so on. So um, yeah. By, by the way, Detlef is uh, in the in the in the chats raised this point a couple of times, and in, in that. 
the use of the prefix uh, and Detlef, maybe you can chime in with your comment um, and not have me interpret it, but it's like you're, you're kind of alluding to the need to use a prefix is potentially a failing in the UI of the software of the application. Um, and I kind of personally, I kind of agree and disagree on that because I think the use of the prefix enables um, for quick visual affordance um, that is helpful. Uh, the other thing and the way I use it is I may want to make a claim that I can visually recognize when I'm doing my thinking, but when mm -hmm. I've got my other blocks of writing out here, you know, and this is a, particularly one of the things I really value with Tinderbox is you can use the action code in Tinderbox that creates another attribute or variable. So if you think that there's two meta, meta, meta elements, you have the name attribute, and let's say, and I call it the short title, and I have another attribute called short title. And so I have Tinderbox automatically parse out the prefix into short title. So at any point in time, I get yeah, 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 yeah. the both worlds. I can have the note named with the prefix, but whenever I want to use that name in writing, where the use of a prefix would break the flow of the re of reading the writing, yeah, yeah, that's already been automatically stripped out, and then I can transclude or include that that unprefixed name in any of my other material, but still reference back to the original note. Yeah, and I find that very helpful. I would like that. Um, we sort of played around with that a little bit in the canvas prototype where when you put things on the canvas, it's really useful to have different levels of representation. Um, and if you have a note schema, then you can define, right? What is it you want to display in different contexts, uh, which again, we would have to implement in Rome, yeah. right? Because it doesn't, it doesn't know about note types, um, but in a kind of type aware PKM, you can do things like that and it seems really useful. Mm -hmm. um, so Detlef, did I represent your question or comment appropriately or? Uh, I have a... Yeah, perfectly, perfectly. Uh, and uh, Joel al already answered everything. Um, that's exactly, if I, I would, I prefer to have a structure and a uh, user interface that represents the structure without having to uh, use uh, any prefix. The prefix is a hack. Um, uh, and yeah, yeah, yeah. because Rome doesn't have different types mm -hmm. of, of nodes, you have to hack it. And yeah. um, that's that's the main problem. And you lose something because if you use a prefix, you always uh, lose flexibility. If you have a scheme, you can modify the scheme. With a prefix, you you never can modify it. It's it's a one-time structure. You you fix it for all the all the time. For sure, you can reprocess everything and and uh, rebuild yeah. it but yeah. uh it's it's not that flexible it should be yeah as opposed to an actual schema right like actual actually support a type structure yeah 100 percent agree um so okay there's actually another rabbit hole that that question opens up which is uh that is like a research question of is it useful do we actually have a hard distinction between claims and evidence uh, ontologically, and the answer is complicated. Uh, practically, it's super useful to distinguish between claims and evidence. Uh, it helps me sort of understand how uncertain I am, how open a question is. Um, it helps me sort of contextualize my claims a lot more. Um, but ontologically, I don't think it's a hard distinction because like at a certain level, everything's a claim. And uh, people who... Uh, care a lot about clean data structures get upset with this like hard distinction between claims and evidence because like there's actually not like a deep ontological difference between them like it's uh it's it's based on usage right and um you know at a certain level it becomes more of an evidence like thing where it's like much closer to the data and then at a certain level but one person's claim is another person's evidence one discipline's claim is another person's another discipline's evidence uh, so that's a whole rabbit hole. And one of the users actually um, sort of discussed with us about this, like, I don't want to, like, have a fixed type for my thing. Some of my types are contextual. In this context, it's serving as a hypothesis. In this other context, it's serving as a conclusion. In this context, it's serving as a claim. Uh, this, this kind of fixed typing structure does not support that. Um, but, uh, you know, like, we, I think, would it be great if it was contextual? Yes. Um, that's extremely technically hard. Um, and it's not clear. You would need, uh, I think, much richer understanding of context to be able to implement like 
contextual types. So that's like a rabbit hole that I'm aware of that, uh, you know, I know this is not perfect. Uh, and it's sort of, as long as we keep that in mind, I think we're okay. We don't like pretend that these are like, you know, actually representing the world, but they're pragmatically useful as a way to organize things. Um, cool. So um, this part I think is a bit more exciting maybe, um, but I found it super useful in meetings and discussions to have a discourse graph because it's, as I, as I alluded to earlier, it's a navigation aid such that I can pull things up way quicker. So instead of saying, uh, Michael Becker did a project on this thing that's kind of related, you should go look it up or I'm gonna send the PDF to you later. I can literally pull things up as I'm talking to people to support the discussion right there and then, right? I have typically have room up and screen share or like, you know, together um, that sort of supports our meeting notes. So, um, <laughs> yeah, so actually a project meeting, we're like, um, how should we, uh, what new tasks should we study? And we're like sort of like brainstorming. Um, but then I was able to pull up, there was this one study that had this like interesting block design task. Um, and I was able to pull it up like, yeah, it was this like Lawson study. And so I pulled this up and I was immediately able to pull up the task and show it during a meeting. Uh, as opposed to like, I guess I could have pulled up the PDF and scrolled down to find that one part that had the task in it. I think maybe it would have been close to the same speed, but it was quite different. Um, it felt quite different. It was like pull up this this particular result is from this task and I can pull up right away and, because and, I have this. And question for you. So are you copying and pasting that material into Rome? This one? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, okay. so this is a screenshot, and this is a pain point. I don't like right. it. I right. don't and, like that it's called. So, so, so here's an analogy, and let me kind of make the correlation there. So you can do that in Tinderbox, too. You can take those images and paste them into a note, and they work just fine. Yep. The other thing I really like about Tinderbox is, uh, and I just experienced this myself about three weeks ago doing my doctoral research, is as I was reviewing through inter um, you know, qualitative interviews that I was doing with people, I was finding that the... Um, and Kim Peterson actually was one of them. Um, I, I was finding that the um, the AI translation of the text to audio wasn't that great. Mm. And so I realized I really want to hear what they actually said, not be reading what they said because the translation of the, the yeah, yeah, yeah. was off. Yeah. And so using Tinderbox and tied with Hook, another tool, mm. I was able to create a URI schema basically that said, yeah, oh, here's the timestamp of that place in the video click here in, in a Tinderbox URL, and it took me right to that video to that timestamp, to yes. exactly where they were speaking. And yep. so you can do that something similar with PDF files. You can go right to the page or right to the that point in the PDF file. And so you don't actually mm -hmm. need to copy and paste it into Tinderbox. All you need is the reference URL. And that works out really well. I agree. Um... So you can like, so what I know is like you can, you can have a URI schema that gets you to, I think technically you can have a URI schema that gets you to a particular bounding box area on the PDF as well, which gets you a snapshot. Right. Um, but yeah, you can definitely do like easily, like, you know, open well, this and, PDF and again, to this particular the, the, page. Going back to that action code reference though, is, you know, and, and just to be clear in the way I did it is I took the interview was able to explode the interview out by timestamps and then using action code, the, the URL was actually dynamically created. I didn't have to do mm. anything. Yeah. Right. And there was no manual work once I got the, the functions processed properly. And so I, th I see the, the relevance between what you're doing here and what we can accomplish in Tinderbox. Yeah. Yeah. This, this works well enough, like just screenshot put in here because I need to see it, but I also need to know where it came from. Um, be able to go back to it. So I manually type in this, the page number, which I don't like. Um, so this is, this is some friction. Uh, but again, like the point here was like, it's, it was useful to immediately bring it up. Another thing that I keep bringing up is like this result from, uh, it was the um, network, right? 
yeah, this one I keep showing. This this interesting result on cementing networks uh, for Montessori educated children and like showing this kind of analysis. Uh, it's like an ongoing project that we're formulating. Um, they can show and like quickly see like look, it looks like this. Of course, we'll like you know later on like the student or collaborator can go um, read the paper more deeply. But to support the discussion, it's really useful to have that like up really quickly so they know what I mean when I say use a network analysis. Um, you can see directly here. Helpful actually for cross disciplinary um, conversations. Um, I can't just assume that they've read the paper. Uh, I can actually show it to them. Um, yeah, I, I think I'll, I think those are good examples. Um, and then this one got exciting. One of my master's students used the discourse graph to uh, kind of structure his thinking about his thesis draft. So he was able to sort of draw from my knowledge, both from our discussions, but also what was represented in the Rome graph more efficiently than here's a stack of papers read it and you know pull out all the key insights and cite cite them um, he was able to go in and navigate through this to find relevant citations uh, think through how it relates to his problem formulation for his thesis um, i i was very happy when i saw this uh, it was like makes my job easier makes your job easier makes my job easier um, improves our discussions so we have like shared context and so on so this is one example, um, and then another student is drafting a mega essay uh, on a new kind of synthesis approach, and he's using questions and claims and patterns as a way to structure his thinking. Uh, here's an example, right? We need new research synthesis method. What are citizens systems like now? Um, what was useful about this kind of shared structure of questions and claims is that I could um, give comments on his drafting that connect to previous resources that I've collected and consolidated into a question claim evidence structure that enables to be to be more efficient and deep in my comments instead of just saying like you should go read this thing like we've sort of taken notes on this we discussed this in the past here are some like quick navigation aids to previous leads um okay so, so one thing you're talking about then too is so you're unlike us have not having a roam account so we can't actually interact with you so there's like a shared Yes. Ah, good. Thank you for asking. Collaborative that. Rome yeah. environment yeah. that you're having here. This is an implicit. That thing. raises yeah. the question then too. Who? Oh, yeah. I'm going to get to, straight to the business side of it. At the end of the day, who owns that material? Like, is it you, the originator of that? Is that the student? I mean, how do you manage the ah the the ownership of the knowledge that gets? Created? I don't think about that at all. So I have no answer for you. <laughs> I mean, we're we're all in the same graph and like we manage this uh, at the sort of contribution level as opposed to the atomic like question claim evidence and by authorship yeah, we say like yeah, you are I just, yeah so like we don't really think about it here we can kind of track right like who made which note but we don't really care about that from a credit point of view uh, from an ownership point of view uh, and then we sort of like negotiate at the when we write this up as a paper who's the first author who's the last author like we sort of think about it that way mm -hmm. um I, I yeah, so I don't have to so answer for so you. I don't really think about that. Pool of it's a common giant pool of evidence and knowledge and claims and yes, which I don't like. I like and I don't like. So um yeah, so I neglected to say that this is PKM, but also CKM is co collaborative, um in a crude way, right? Everybody is in this graph. Everybody has edit access. All of my students do, and so they can just write directly in here. They can edit everything, which means they can edit my stuff. We have a very poor permission structure in Rome, and there's no like mechanism for notifying me that my thing was edited. 
So we have to sort of manually split, write these conventions. It is really useful for them to have access to everything though, because they can sort of, you know, navigate and they can have access to all of my notes. I can have access to all their notes. And so that's really useful. But like, there's a lot of like missing things that are super useful for collaboration. They're not implemented in Rome. Now, when we yeah. first talked though, too, you talked about how, using a different tool yourself for your, your private, private stuff. Yes. And that's the low, the low log seek or which one, what do you I use? use Obsidian. Obsidian. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. So, and we haven't really talked about that. So Obsidian is like for your private, private and Rome because of its online collaborative stuff. That's where you. That's one of the primary reasons why I'm still stuck in Rome is that my students are actively doing work, drawing from the stuff that's in Rome. Okay. Uh, so it's, it's hard for me to migrate right now because like, you know, I'm not going to, I'm going to disrupt them. Um, so that's part of it. Um, also, like I've got this kind of like set up for all the knowledge is represented in this. I will say though, like, you know, because, so what we've done with extension, because it knows about types, um, I can use the extension to export just the discourse graph into Markdown. And I have done that. And that's, that's this. Um, so I have a Obsidian published site that has only my discourse graph not all the other stuff that's in the Rome graph, just the questions, claims, and evidence, and sources. Um, I'm drop this in the chat. And so, um, how do you? How do you? So I okay. So I'm I'm getting and I'm getting inspired by this a little bit too because I could see using my you you use Obsidian, I use Tinderbox, right? You could. How do you manage the friction between your personal tool into the collaborative CKM tool? I, I don't think we've ever talked about that before and at length in the in our in our forum. Uh. I sidestep that problem because my personal research work is in here. My personal vault on an Obsidian is purely journaling, uh, task management, which is related to what's going on in the room graph, but uh, a URL to a project page is just fine um, from, the, from the Obsidian vault. Other people have more problems where they have a vault that has their personal journal reflections, uh, trip planning, everything is in one place, and then they part research, and so like disentangling that is a lot harder. I don't have that problem. Okay. Um, I will show one thing though that I think is really cool. One of my students is using Obsidian for his personal research fault, and we have that problem of he has claims and questions and evidence that are emerging from an ongoing research project and related to literature. See. These are claims. We've got particular results from our ongoing study. We have questions. And these connect to, literally, to our discussions. So we have meeting notes in Rome. And I'll point him to relevant literature, but also questions and claims and evidence. And we'll develop them together. Uh, we don't have a good way for this to talk to each other right now. Um, there's an obsidian URI structure that we can put into Rome to refer from Obsidian to Rome. There's a URL from Rome that we can link to in Obsidian, but that's very unsatisfying because like it's not live. Um, there was a startup that one of my friends and collaborators was working on called Same Page that was supposed to do the thing of, I can sync up specific notes between uh, Same page that one. Yeah. Between applications. They had working prototypes of syncing up Obsidian, LockSeq, and Rome pages, but it wasn't polished enough for me to actually use. That's actually what I want. Is like there's some things that are shared and I should be able to refer to and build on a note, whether it's in Obsidian, Tinderbox, Rome, LockSeq, or whatever. Not all of it, but at least some of it, right? You can see the desire path, right? Like, you know, some of these questions and claims and evidence are the same. They're literally copy duplicated from the Rome graph. Um, there's this scaling synthesis um, project, Hypertext uh, site that was born of collaboration with another person, Rob Hayesfield and Brandon Langan. And so this note inspired a lot of thinking in this Hypertext notebook. But this is duplicated from 
oh, there you go. Back here. It's duplicated from this note. Ideally, we'll have something more like a reference or transclusion, but right now we're sort of copy pasting. But we can see like this helps, um, you know, the collaboration on synthesis with Rob and Brendan was helped by them having access to this discourse graph and enable them to sort of extend their thinking towards building out this whole thing, right? Uh, where is it? Yeah, here, right? This compression facility synthesis, let them, let him to think through hypertext enables communication, high information density is referring to all these things, right? It's useful, you know, it sort of helped uh, structure thinking, but I don't like it that this is just a static duplicate of my thinking. So as of, was, does yeah. ROM use markdown files like Obsidian does, or is it, what's its file structure? Do you know? There's two answers to that. The one answer is that it's a data log database. Uh, so that, that's the data structure. Text-wise, it's a flavor of Markdown. It's not the same as Obsidian. There's some differences, but a lot of similarities. But 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 if it's a flavor and there's a pattern, because I'm always I'm keep going back to the Tinderbox model, right? If there's a flavor and it's a pattern, and like Devin think it's an open Mac OS folder mm -hmm. schema, you could take that pattern, put that in as a Tinderbox template, hit publish, and when you did one of the share notes into the Roam structure, you could just simply publish those notes into that Roam directory. And then theory, that would then sync itself back up into the web environment. Uh, it won't work that smoothly because uh, you can export from room to Markdown and import from Markdown. But the, the database is, like I said, it's, it's the database. database. The database. So there'd be one yeah. step. You'd have to do the formal import. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, if you, you, can, you can export, uh, Rome can import any Markdown file and it exports to Markdown. Um, but you have to use the API to like write directly to the database, which exists. There's a Roam API that's pretty good. Um, okay, well, uh, oh, Tinderbox has a run command, so you could use that API to publish right into the run command then. Yeah. I wouldn't want to publish to Roam though. <laughs> I would want to publish to Tinderbox so I can take advantage of the visual thinking and all the, the power in there. Well, I'm trying to do the bi-directional, the collaborative. Yeah, thing. yeah, yeah. So yeah. You, need that, you need that collaborative. Yeah, model. yeah. It's so I'm really sad that same page is on pause. Uh, he went on to like work for a startup, but uh, I want this to I want this to exist um, much more of a cross, um, yeah. Okay. All right, where are we at? So yeah, those those are those are the examples. I think I showed you a little bit. I can just really quickly show you how it works. So those are the outcomes, right? That's what it's like right now. I'm pretty happy um, with a lot of it. Uh, it really helps me. I feel more uh, rigorous, more creative, uh, more engaged uh, when I'm sort of be able to draw on this. Um, it helps me work better with other people. Um, so, so let me ask you a question then. So it seems like to your point, you open this up with, let, let, let me show you how we process synthesis, mm -hmm. how, how I do it individually, how we as a team do it um, to synthesize our discourse graph, our evidence, yeah. our claims, um, et cetera. Um, what I've not yet seen is how do you publish? Like, where do you actually go write the paper? Do you end up then moving this out into a Scrivener or, or a Google Doc or Word, do Word file or... Overleaf, okay. Yeah, I don't love it. I think it's okay actually because like uh, the output of like research papers is hyper specific to a particular audience, whereas what's written in Rome is for us. So we need to do the translation anyway. So what helps is so I showed you that thing, right? Um, let's go back here. I showed you this uh, example here right, of redrafting the intro flow. So notice this is like just a kind of process mechanic that's kind of different, just separate from, so from the discourse graph, I essentially have these like bits of text that are my words that I can start as a draft in like the introduction section. And I'll copy paste this text into 
introduction section in an overly file, which is this LaTeX, right? And then I need to cite them, right? So these site keys are page titles for papers in Rome, such that if I have a piece of evidence that's grounded in a citation, I immediately know what I'm going to copy paste as the citation in the research paper draft. Mm -hmm. So that's how it works. It's copy paste over like the text of the claim question or evidence is a great starting point. I'll put it in there. I'll refine it for whatever needs to be refined for this audience. And the citation Got is it. already linked to my question claim and I put it in here. Yeah. Got it. So again, going back to my personal use and thinking about it in the nature of Tinderbox, I see everything you're doing in Rome or even Obsidian for that nature is what I'm calling my resources folder. And then mm -hmm. my research assessment. Um, mm -hmm. And then what, because of Tinderbox templating, those are all I would call my Zettelkasten-esque atomic notes. Yeah. Right? Then I can create another container I call my papers, books, and articles. And then using yeah. Tinderbox, I can either pull those in as it includes or trans includes. I yeah. can um, start my original writing. I can use um, uh, you know, citation anchor marks to pull in citation references and such like that. Uh, and then... Um, and that becomes really, really powerful. So again, it's a way to kind of do all of this in one. Yeah. In, in, in Tinderbox, if you once you've learned those fundamental blocks of action code and export code and such in Tinderbox. Yeah. I I would like that. Let, let's let's reconvene next week. I'll re, I, I, since since the time you and I have last talked, Mark Bernstein has released two pretty major, you know, a major release and a a, a, a several ah. updates to the major release, and it's gotten pretty smooth. Cool. Yeah, let's see it. Um, yeah, Mark, you mentioned uh, Marshall and Shipman. That is major, major, major inspiration for like how we design this, right? Like incremental formalization is at the heart and soul of like how we think about adding structure. We're not like the two extremes, right? Like the only thing you can say is questions, claims, and evidence. Only use these types versus everything's unstructured. How do we integrate the structure when it's useful into um, the sort of visual spatial or whatever um, is like major design principle for, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Kim Peterson's hand is up. So Joel, do you have any examples of uh, how you use the, the Zettelkasten or whatever concept you use for your um, your research oh, with Tinderbox? Do you use Tinderbox or just Obsidian in the actual I have not used um, Tinderbox. Yeah. Just to, um, you, you do I, use Tinderbox. I have not used it. I have not. Oh, I have like, not. Okay. Yeah. Not, it's great. No, I've not yeah. tried it. I, I agree. Like, um, so I will I will say that is this person familiar to anybody? I really want to talk to this person. Uh I sort of came across this, I think, in some random Discord post of like this person trying to translate my discourse graph workflow into tinderbox using prototypes and i was like this is great like look this is what it looks like in, can you pop uh, that link in the chat yes absolutely it is also in the link here i think but yeah this made me so happy because it like sort of validated my hypothesis that like this is so easy in tinderbox uh right like because you it's type aware um, and it's even better because uh, because it's type aware and also Tinderbox really thinks very carefully about uh, like Mark you you know you actually know hypertext uh, and you also recognize the importance of visual uh, different views of the data like Rome has the outline and a horrible graph view that is useless but in in Tinderbox if you have you know these types you can do this you can sort of explore it this way. Uh, you can view it as a table, right? You can view it as an outline, all these things, which I when we know to be like really important for sense making. Um, can't do that. Um, in yeah, but I, this is what it would look like. I, if if I were to try to do it in Tinderbox, I would it would look something like this. The only thing I see lacking right now with Tinderbox in comparison to what we've been talking about is that is that collaborative element. 
Yeah. And lacking, lacking is a, a, a probably a negative term that is not appropriate. Negative. negative yeah. Term. That collaborative. I, I'm not. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not convinced that um, the way that we do it in Rome is ideal. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, I think. I think my mental model is really want rather than a way for everybody to be in the same graph, have a good way to incrementally share parts of your knowledge base and with hypertext it's complicated because it's so interlinked so there's like design problems to be solved there the only tool that i know of that is thinking about this actually is tana where i think notion kind of did this right you have like workspaces and you can cross reference and they're apparently sunsetting this now but that's the mental model i think that is really useful is like i've got my own space you've got your own space if we have a common grammar we can pass things back and forth and reference between them but we have an access structure. Um, you know, I can share things with you as read only, reference only, or edit, whatever. We need that. Um, having everything in the same graph gets really messy. We have to like be very intentional about enforcing the same conventions, um, all that kind of stuff. So like I I yeah. So I, I think collaboration is complicated in general, but I think a little bit more complicated with extra challenges with hypertext collaboration. Uh, so I think it's a really interesting, a really interesting problem. Um, that I don't have like good answers for, but I want to get to. Awesome. All right, we've got about three minutes left. We have three minutes. No, but <laughs> we obviously actually, we can go long. I mean, it's not a hard We actually thing. got a lot of the kind of questions and feedback that I wanted to get to. Um, so let me let me see. Uh, but, but I said that not to shut us down in three minutes because we can go long. Yeah. We can go long as, as long as you want. Or yeah. can't. Um, but the question for everyone here is: does anybody else have any comments, questions? Kim, thanks for chiming in. You know, what are your what are your art? Art, you're always um, astute here. You got anything you want to chime in on for us? No, I'm um, actually it's it's so impressive, and uh, I, I'm actually um, stunned almost at the level at which the you have contained all this data and organized it. And again, bringing back to the. Uh, um, the meetup on Jerry's the brain. So much of the personal optimization and 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 look and feel of a database is determined by the intimacy which the user has with their uh, database. Personally, that much data actually is stressing me out a little bit, <laughs> but, well, but it's impressive. Well, and I, but and, and also too, how many people in your team have adopted these patterns? I mean, because a, a requirement for this process is we're all going to use the same tool and we're all going to choose to follow our implicit collaborative rules. No, no? you're asking me. Uh, so Jason, Arvin, uh, C, J, four, four students are actively using uh, this. And then C is implementing this in his own Obsidian vault. Uh, and then Salma is not using Rome at all, but she's adopted the discourse graph kind of structure um, in her Notion database for her literature review. Um, so that's that's how it works right now. Yeah, but and I've got like collaborators who have access to this Rome graph as well, um, but they don't use it to edit. They can draw from it. Um, so they have like, it's easier for me to sort of like, uh, I think I gave like I gave feedback to um, on a draft and then I pointed people to it. Um, so yeah, but yeah, but, about but five people right now but, using this but process. there's a certain forming, norming, storming that you bring everybody together around common set of tools, common set of language, kind of common set of culture, if you will, mm -hmm. on how we're going to generally do this. Yeah. Oh, was that a question? Sorry. I, I think a I question understood. statement. Yes or no. Is that true? False? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, how do, I, and, how, and how do you go about doing that? And how long did that take to get to that? I don't like how I did it. Member. How long? I don't like how I did it. I I wish so. Uh, Matt Akamatsu had is a one of our users, um, who like I mentioned has taken this to the next level. He's doing it very deliberately in his new lab. They start up for cell biology at University of Washington, and so they have like very considered descriptions of the philosophy and mechanics of how to do things that I do not have because because this started with my is this was my graph to start with and I was like sharing with my students and now it's the lab graph but it's not structured as a lab graph yet we don't have like conventions we don't have like 
So like uh, you can see, I started to get at this with, so if this like project where we're trying to translate um, a living literature review on social media and democracy into a discourse graph. Um, and so I had like two research assistants that I hadn't had the time to work with yet that I need to quickly get up to speed on this way of working. So it would force me to externalize a lot more of what happened just in one-on-one -on -one meetings with my students that took like a year or like months to a year to like understand like this is how we work, this is how it works, like you know, this is how the mechanics work. Um, I didn't have time to set up like a, you know, so Matt actually paid somebody to develop like tutorials and resources and whatever to sort of improve onboarding, which you would do for a lab manager, right? Like you know, if you're, you're working in a lab, there's like particular ways of dealing with the, the cell, cell lines and whatever that you must have documentation for and protocols. Um, that's just how it works. And so he did that for literature review as well. Um, I didn't have the money to do that or time. And so it was, it happens on one-on-one, -on -one, but I had to write it up for this one. So this one has a nice, I think, decent description of like how we think about claims and evidence. That is a nice, like you can start there. Um, is that public? I wrote up. This is actually read access to everybody. Yeah. So here's the link. Yeah, Ergo, can you share the link? I think yeah, here's the want. link. Uh, and then procedure for basic processing papers was it's a lot more structured because we are actually trying to get through um, a bunch of papers in a set amount of time. And, um, and if you can pause on that one real quick, Mark just posed that similar question this week in our forum about how would you use Tinderbox for the for procedures and processing? Am I making that connection appropriately, Mark? Yeah. So that that's interesting. So we'll, I think we'll want to dig into that a little bit more too. So definitely if you can share the link with us. Yeah, the link is in the chat. Um, I think I put it in the talk notes as well. Uh, how it works, yeah, here. So right here, a bit more formalized here. Yeah, um, yeah so this is where um, this like idea of incremental formalization was like so important for our thinking. Um, so somebody mentioned Vicky as well. Right, that's like an important thing. Um, so there's a bunch of stuff in HCI as well uh, later, like not necessarily in hypertext specifically. This kind of like really core design principle of like give people the power to add structure um, when it's useful and appropriate, but don't constrain them to only express things in a formalized structure that you define ahead of time. By, um, by the way, on that on that idea of structure and formalization, you you mentioned Marshall and Shipman as a yes. As Can I get a reference for that? Absolutely. By the way, I've been taking notes all along the way, and this will become our forum post following the meeting. So, yeah, all, all these references are going to come out. This was a game changing paper that I read in my postdoc. Uh, it helped explain why my research was stuck for two years. <laughs> I wish I read it earlier. Um, so, I shared it as much as I can because, like, this is a very easy mistake to make for a CS person is to like try to make things nice and neat and formal. Uh, and that's just a poor fit for uh, real collaborative, creative knowledge work. Um, let's see. Uh, so I guess the only thing I, I want that I've not shown you is like, how does this actually work? Like how do I actually make these things? So just very quickly, I can show you, I, I queued up a thing that I had a note for um, in the past that is no, not yet a evidence note. And so I've already, you know, if you take notes, right, you normally like summarize the takeaways anyway. So the only thing that the discourse graph adds is just making Rome know about that. Rome now knows about the type. So how does that work? I literally redesigned it so that you can sort of select the thing hit a hotkey and you say, this is a evidence. That's it. So it like creates a note with the prefix, adds the citation. Um, so now this is like a placeholder that I can reference. So I actually, and then if I want to draw 
a actually this is not the not the result that uh, relates to that so this was like this is really interesting actually uh 60 years for innovation uh for measuring longitude is a result to make it to adoption is fine enough for now it's my evidence this is actually a nice piece of evidence for the claim that true creative breakthroughs often take a long time to develop. Um, so I'm going to say that this is supported by this evidence from Katani. Okay, and by the way, too, uh, uh, what I like what I'm seeing here, too, in in Tinderbox land, one of the reasons why I adopted the use of prefixes is similar to the way you're using it. Let's say you had three notes, all called note. You know, uh -huh. One of those notes might be evidence. One of those notes might be a question. One of those notes might be uh, a pattern. By using yeah. the prefix, when you're doing that kind of linking in Tinderbox land, that's called zip linking. It's a method for linking notes yeah. uh, in line text. Um, by adding the prefix, it helps you distinguish one note named the same name versus a different note named the same name mm -hmm. within the context. Yeah, 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 yeah. So another example would be in my in my industry research, you know, you've got a company called one password, but then you have an application called one password. So which note is it? Is it the application or the company you're you're making reference to? And using the prefix, I would say prod hyphen one password versus Mm -hmm. Entity hyphen one password. And then in the zip linking search, much like I just saw here, that lets you distinguish between the different notes. Yeah. All right, I'm running this query just to show you that by writing that specifically, um, see right here, by writing supported by indenting underneath here, the discourse graph extension recognizes this structure means that there's a piece of evidence that supports this claim and I can recover that in a query. Uh, this is like a tight edge now between this node and this node that I can export, visualize, whatever, as opposed to just like keep it in my memory. This is actually something I wanted to do. So it's killing two birds with one stone. I can demonstrate for you what it feels like to make a discourse graph. And this is going to be helpful for me <laughs> moving forward. Uh, so if I would go back and say like, you know, yeah, people like people don't understand, like, you know, creative breakthroughs take a long time to develop. Here are some specific examples. Like I'm not going to remember 60 years or like this Darwin thing, 34 years. It was dealt. This is really cool, right? I wrote this. When did I write this thing? This is like, yeah, one and a half years ago. So there's no way I'm going to remember this, but I can go back to uh, right here. And I can see, uh, no, I didn't write the, I didn't put screenshots in here. So that's my bad. But I know I can go back to this and like, this is a specific result. Um, this was like very striking result to me. Um, that you look at the notebooks, you can see the develops ideas were pretty much there for 30 years before it was published. So that's it. I think that's all I wanted to show. Um, this was really cool. It was a really good discussion. I, I've lost my I've lost my grip on what's going on in the chat. It looks like there's a lot of interesting stuff in here. Maybe you can, if anybody wants to ask one of the questions, I can discuss that and I have to head out for my lunch. I'm just writing a note here to Detlef. So one thing, I, one thing um, I didn't really see here, um, we'll kind of maybe uh, put this down as, as a, you know, the, the, the nuance or the parlance that I use in this kind of methodology based on what I've heard you talk about here is what I call the five C's. You're collecting notes, you're curating notes, you're creating them, you're collaborating. Mm -hmm. And then at some point you, you're ready to contribute. Yep. And so it, it seems like your process for doing that is you use the disc discourse uh, method mm -hmm. 
uh, for that collection curation, creation, collaboration methodology. Yep. And then hop over to Overly for your contribution output. Yep. Uh, you know, me yeah. mechanisms and uh, efforts. And yep. kind of summary, you've spent time with the team to curate this process for you. And there are mm -hmm. no frictions in this process. Some you've just accepted, some you've agreed, you know, accepted that you want, some you've accepted that you don't like, but you don't have time or the wherewithal yeah. to figure out how to get over them. Mm -hmm. um, but really that that end to end flow is what you've been kind of sharing with us. And that yeah. gives us the synthesis of coming together knowledge, both personally and with collaborative teams. Yeah. Cool. I should have started with that. That's a great like summary of uh what what I shared. Yeah. Well, it's, well you know, often with great. this kind of synthesis, though, you always get the you tend to get the answer at the end, not at the beginning. Yeah, so. exactly. Exactly. Um, yeah, cool. Yeah. This is really fun. Thank you for um thank you for hosting me. I learned a lot as well. And... No, this is a blast. Now, Mark, you want to give us any final yeah. parting remarks or yeah, thank you. This is fascinating. Uh we should talk sometime. Uh, yeah. Come back anytime you are uh, happen to be free. Uh, we have some interesting talks, uh, and uh, we we'd love to have you. Uh, so love thanks, to. everyone. Yeah, and, and Joel, I'll pop you a personal uh, note, and you and I can dig into Tinderbox land, and we'll convert you in short. <laughs> sure. <laughs> <laughs> Take good. care, everybody. All right, All right. Yeah, everybody. Thanks again, Joel. That was awesome. Thanks. Great stuff. Thank you.